3-9-5-7-3-2. Thank you. KPFA, KPFB, Berkeley, 88.1, KFC up in Fresno. Good evening. It's Wednesday, September 23rd. A police officer charged in the Breonna Taylor killing in Louisville, Kentucky, but it's not for causing the innocent woman's death, but shooting recklessly into an adjacent department during a warrantless drug raid in the middle of the night. Protesters are in the streets of Louisville and in several other U.S. cities tonight. President Trump asked directly if he'll submit to a peaceful transfer of power following the November election, and he refuses to commit. Trump says he wants a new Supreme Court justice confirmed before the election to rule on what he says will be massive electoral fraud. Florida's Attorney General asked state and federal law enforcement to investigate possible election law violations after billionaire and former Democratic presidential candidate Mike Bloomberg helps raise more than $16 million for Florida felons to pay their debt so they can vote in the presidential election. He and the Republican governor suggest Bloomberg is buying votes. A huge international study of COVID-19 vaccine that aims to work with just one dose gets underway as top U.S. health officials seek to assure a skeptical Congress and public that they can trust any shots the government ultimately approves. President Trump stands accused of trying to sabotage the work of scientists and public health experts for his own political ends. House Democrats introduced the Protecting Our Democracy Act, a bill aimed at preventing future presidents from undermining democracy, ignoring the Constitution, and violating the law. And California Governor Gavin Newsom says the sale of new gasoline-powered cars and trucks will be banned in the state by the year 2035. From Pacifica Radio, KPFA Berkeley, KPFK Los Angeles, this is the Evening News. I'm Mark Miracle. A Kentucky grand jury today indicted a single former police officer for shooting into neighboring apartments but did not move forward with charges against any officers for their role in Breonna Taylor's death. The jury announced that fired officer Brett Hankison was charged with three counts of wanton endangerment in connection with the police raid of Taylor's home on the night of March 13th. Immediately after the announcement, people were expressing their frustration that the grand jury did not do more. Christina Onestat files this report. Protests are underway in Louisville, Kentucky, Minneapolis, Washington, D.C., and other cities as people express outrage against the grand jury decision to not charge three officers for killing Breonna Taylor in Louisville, Kentucky. Online video shows hundreds of protesters taking to the streets from all directions and at least half a dozen people in handcuffs. Kentucky's Attorney General Daniel Cameron made the grand jury announcement. He says an eyewitness testified police identified themselves and knocked, then entered the home of Breonna Taylor, where they were shot at by Taylor's boyfriend, who admitted to shooting first, thinking there was an intruder in the apartment. After hearing the evidence from our team of prosecutors, the grand jury voted to return an indictment against Detective Hankinson for three counts of wanton endangerment for wantonly placing the three individuals in apartment three in danger of serious physical injury or death. While there are six possible homicide charges under Kentucky law, these charges are not applicable to the facts before us because our investigation showed and the grand jury agreed that Mattingly and Cosgrove were justified in the return of deadly fire after having been fired upon by Kenneth Walker. Fired officer Brett Hankinson's three wanton endangerment charges means he faces up to 15 years in prison. Critics, though, say it's a slap in the face, considering the three charges aren't even related to Taylor's killing. They're related to endangering Taylor's neighbors for firing a bullet into the neighbor's home. 
Taylor's family declined to hold a press conference. They settled with the city over Taylor's death for some $12 million earlier this month. Family attorney Benjamin Crump wrote in a statement, quote, This is outrageous and offensive to Breonna Taylor's memory. It's yet another example of no accountability for the genocide of persons of color by white police officers, unquote. He had this to say while at a press conference about a separate police shooting of a black man in Arizona. Breonna Taylor. Zara, sister who, I mean, she's in her apartment. She's in the sanctity of her home. The place where you are expected to be safe. Taylor was shot multiple times by the officers. In response to public outcry, Kentucky's governor, Andrew Beshear, spoke about the grand jury's decision not to charge an officer in Taylor's shooting death. He's calling for the facts that led to the decision be released to the general public. I believe that the public deserves this information. So I previously made what what I would call a suggestion to the attorney general, and now I'm making the request that he post online all the information, evidence, and facts that he can release without impacting the three felony indictments, the three felony counts in the indictment issued today. Everyone can and should be informed. And those that are currently feeling frustration, feeling hurt, they deserve to know more. I trust Kentuckians. They deserve to see the facts for themselves. Authorities have said they were investigating Breonna Taylor's boyfriend for selling drugs at the time they raided her home. While there were no drugs in Taylor's apartment, her boyfriend did shoot and wound a police officer during the incident. The grand jury agreed. The officer's shots that killed Taylor were fired in self-defense. Attorney General Cameron, a Republican and Kentucky's first black attorney general, insisted prosecutors had followed the law, even though, quote, my heart breaks for Miss Taylor, unquote. I'm Christina Onestead, reporting for KPFA. Kentucky's Attorney General Daniel Cameron, who presented evidence in the case to the grand jury, is a protege of Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, who has been tagged by some as his heir apparent. He was also one of 20 names on President Donald Trump's list to fill a future Supreme Court vacancy. Cameron said today that the FBI is still investigating potential violations of federal law in the case. And this late development in the story, Louisville police say an officer has been shot as protests grow over the lack of charges for officers in Breonna Taylor's killing. There are no details on the extent of the shooting or the condition of the officer. Attorneys for a black man shot and killed by Los Angeles County Sheriff's deputies say he wasn't holding a gun when they opened fire, contradicting an account from the department. Attorney General, or Attorney Benjamin Crump said that Dijon Kizzy posed no threat to deputies when they fired 19 shots at him on August 31st. The deputies had tried to stop Kizzy in South Los Angeles for riding a bicycle in the wrong direction. They said he ran, struggled with the deputy, then picked up a gun he had dropped. A video shows Kizzy stooping down, but a wall blocks a full view and no weapon can be seen. A black man has filed a $2.5 million claim against the city of Tempe, Arizona, after a police officer held him at gunpoint while looking for an armed white suspect at a hotel. The Arizona Republic reports the claim per A precursor to a lawsuit was filed by hotel employee Trevanye Kumpian over his August 29th detention by Officer Ronald Kurzaya. Video shows Kurzaya held Kumpian at gunpoint despite Kumpian not matching the suspect's description. The officer wouldn't lower his gun until he confirmed Kumpian was an employee. The suspect was not found. Four people filed a federal lawsuit today demanding that Facebook prevent militias and hate groups from using the site after a militia group used the platform to draw armed people to protest in Wisconsin last month that left two people dead. 
The plaintiffs, including the partner of one of the slain men, contend in their lawsuit that Facebook received more than 400 complaints about a militia group's post, but that its moderators decided the post did not violate the company's policies. The group called on armed people to guard property in Kenosha, Wisconsin, after several nights of sometimes violent protests following the shooting of an African-American man, Jacob Blake, a 17-year-old from Illinois, is charged with killing two protesters. A former member of a black radical group who was convicted in the 1971 killings of two New York City police officers has been granted parole after more than four decades behind bars. Officials said today that the State Board of Parole, after a hearing this month, found Anthony Bottom should be released from prison on or before October 20th. His parole follows that of co-defendant Herman Bell in the year 2018. Authorities have said the two were members of the Black Liberation Army, which sanctioned symbolic killings of police officers. Bottom and Bell claimed they were innocent and had been framed by the FBI. With crowds of admirers swelling outside, Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg was remembered today at the court by grieving family, colleagues, and friends as a prophet for justice who preserved against long odds to become an American icon. The court's eight justices, masked along with everyone else because of the coronavirus pandemic, gathered for the first time in more than six months for the ceremony to mark Ginsburg's death from cancer last week at the age of 87 after 27 years on the court. Supreme Court Chief Justice John Roberts. She will live on in what she did to improve the law and the lives of all of us. And yet, still, Ruth is gone, and we grieve. Robert said the woman who late in life became known in admiration as the notorious RBG wanted to be an opera virtuoso. Robert said she became a rock star instead with the Supreme Court as her stage. More from reporter Nick Harper. Justice Ginsburg's casket has been placed in the Supreme Court for a two-day public viewing. She was only the second woman in U.S. history to serve on the Supreme Court, a liberal icon who passed away last week at the age of 87. But her death has prompted a fight to find her replacement. President Trump has vowed to nominate a new justice on Saturday, likely a conservative thinker who would swing the balance of the nine-justice court heavily to the right. Nick Harper, New York. Ginsburg's casket is to be moved to the U.S. Capitol, where she will lie in state. She will be the first woman to do so. Next week, she'll be buried in Arlington National Cemetery next to her late husband. President Donald Trump today would not commit to providing a peaceful transition of power after Election Day, lending further fuel to concerns he may not relinquish his office should he lose in November. Well, we're going to have to see what happens, Trump said when asked at a White House briefing today whether he'd commit to a peaceful transition, one of the cornerstones of American democracy. Trump has previously refused to say whether he would accept the election results, echoing his sentiments from 2016, and he has joked, he says he's joked, about staying in office well past the constitutionally bound two terms. But his refusal to guarantee a violence-free transition went further and is likely to alarm his opponents already on edge, given his deployment of federal law enforcement to quell protests in American cities. His reluctance to commit to a peaceful transition was rooted in what he said were concerns about ballots, again repeating his lies that widespread mail-in voting is rife with fraud. Democrat, I mean, it's Democrat governors. It's states controlled by Democrat governors. And they're sending them out by the millions. And then they talk about you're suppressing our right to vote. They're using COVID as a way of scamming the system. And when you talk about foreign countries, foreign countries are nothing compared to what's taking place. And if foreign countries want to, this is an easy system to break into because they'll do counterfeit ballots. 
They'll do counterfeit ballots by the millions. I think it's very important. I think this will end up in the Supreme Court. And I think it's very important that we have nine justices. Trump is set to formally unveil his pick to replace the late Ruth Gader Ginsburg at On the Supreme Court on Saturday at the White House, Senate Republicans have indicated they will move swiftly to confirm the selection before the November 3rd election. In 2016, Senate Republicans and Trump said it wasn't right for President Barack Obama, a Democrat, to replace Justice Antonin Scalia because it was an election year. Scalia died 237 days before the 2016 election. Ginsburg's death on Friday came 46 days before the 2020 election. You're listening to the Evening News on KPFA in Berkeley, KPFK Los Angeles, KFCF Fresno, online at kpfa.org. Vice President Mike Pence and Ivanka Trump are bringing President Donald Trump's law and order campaign message to Minneapolis tomorrow, showing support for law enforcement in the city where George Floyd's death sparked angry and sometimes violent protests that spread around the world. Pence and President Trump's daughter plan to host a listening session with a Cops for Trump group as well as with residents who the Trump re-election campaign says have been negatively impacted by crime and violent extremism. The visit comes about a month after Trump met with small business owners whose stores in Minneapolis were damaged in demonstrations that erupted after Floyd's death. Trump did not visit the scene of the protest nor the site where police held Floyd down as they tried to arrest him for allegedly passing a counterfeit $20 bill at a convenience store. The schedule for Pence and Ivanka Trump doesn't include those places either. Their campaign appearance will come on the heels of a demonstration in the state capitol today against the political use of tactics to divide the American people. Mike Moen reports. Minnesota has seen many seldom-heard voices come to the forefront in 2020, and many more hope to catch the attention of policymakers and political candidates with an event in St. Paul today. Nearly 20 advocacy groups are celebrating voters from diverse backgrounds, and they say it's time for elected officials to take them seriously. Their march to the state capitol aims to send a message at a time when political divisiveness grips the region. Minister Janae Bates of the group Faith in Minnesota says with the pandemic and the police killing of George Floyd, there's a stronger sense to speak up. Minnesotans all across the state of every race and region and religion have really started to awaken to the fact that things have to change and that we can actually be the ones to change it. Organizers hope that by energizing voters, they can help to usher in leadership that takes a realistic look at the needs of all communities without political gamesmanship. Bates says the message is aimed at all political parties. Social distancing and other safety guidelines have been advised for the event. Bates says they also don't want leaders who stoke tensions over such issues such as public safety in urban areas. She says pitting communities against each other only leads to more anger, not solutions. We organize people in in the cities, in the metro, in the suburbs, and in greater Minnesota. And what we're finding is that all of these folks have similar problems. The things that are different is that we're being told different people to point the blame at. Minnesota doesn't have a race for governor this year, but state legislative seats are up for grabs. And there's a hotly contested U.S. Senate race, as well as elections in congressional districts. Mike Moen, Public News Service. Florida's Attorney General today asked state and federal law enforcement to investigate possible election law violations after billionaire and former Democratic presidential candidate Mike Bloomberg helped raise more than $16 million for Florida felons to pay their debts so they can vote in the presidential election. Attorney General Ashley Moody sent letters to the Florida Department of Law Enforcement and the FBI saying that further investigation is warranted. Governor Ron DeSantis had asked Moody to review allegations that Bloomberg and the Florida Rights Restoration Coalition had violated the law by offering incentives for voting. DeSantis and Moody are both Republicans. 
Moody said in her written statement he's instructed the statewide prosecutor to work with law enforcement and any statewide grand jury that the governor may call. In 2018, Florida voters approved a constitutional amendment to restore most felons' voting rights once they've completed their sentences. The exception was for murderers and sex offenders. But when crafting the law to implement the amendment, the Republican-dominated legislature sabotaged it by requiring that all fines, court fees, and restitution be paid before voting rights could be restored. Bloomberg announced this week that he raised more than $16 million to help pay off the financial obligations for felons so they can vote. While the coalition says it doesn't target people based on their political affiliation, Attorney General Moody is questioning whether the donation violates law that prohibits giving people incentives to vote. The money Bloomberg raised is targeted for felons who registered to vote while the law was in question and who owe $1,500 or less. That accounts for about 31,000 people in a state that decided the 2000 presidential election by 537 votes. That could be critical in a year when polls show Trump and former Vice President Joe Biden in a dead heat in Florida. In Durham, home of the University of New Hampshire, Democratic nominee Hillary Clinton beat Donald Trump in 2016 by more than 4,000 votes. She won the whole state and its four electoral college votes by less than 3,000. Laura Rossbrow Tellum reports. The student vote in New Hampshire could decide if President Donald Trump or Democratic nominee Joe Biden win the state, according to a voting expert. 2016 Democratic presidential nominee Hillary Clinton had her narrowest victory in the Granite State, beating Trump by less than 3,000 votes. But in the four main college towns, she won by more than 14,000 votes. Voter Protection Court Chair Quentin Palfrey argues that student voter turnout here is critical. The student population in New Hampshire often provides the margin of victory one way or the other. The swing from Republican to Democrat or the other way around often hinges upon the question of student vote turnout. Palfrey says that while young people mostly support Democrats, they do not always vote in large numbers. He is concerned that online misinformation and difficulties in voting absentee, particularly for students living out of state due to COVID-19, could hamper their participation. In New Hampshire, anyone can use the coronavirus as a reason to register to vote by mail, including students temporarily living away. Palfrey says young people tend to participate more in elections they're excited about, and that high primary turnout usually indicates increased presidential voter turnout. He mentions the September primary here. Even in last week's state primary, the turnout was pretty robust. It was pretty robust on both sides. So I think that there's good reason to suspect that we will have high turnout. The state primary on September 8th had one of the highest turnouts in New Hampshire history, with more people voting than in 2018. Support for this reporting was provided by the Carnegie Corporation of New York. I'm Laura Rossbrow-Tellum, reporting for Public News Service. Under measures President Trump announced today, Americans won't be allowed to bring home cigars and rum from Cuba to financially starve the island's government, a move taken as he tries to boost his appeal among Cuban Americans, a crucial voting bloc in the battleground state of Florida. The action also comes as Trump considers a Cuban American from Florida for a seat on the U.S. Supreme Court. At a White House ceremony recognizing nearly two dozen veterans of the failed Bay of Pigs invasion of Cuba in 1961, Trump said U.S. travelers will also be prohibited from staying at hotels and other properties owned by the Cuban government. A judge ruled today that Eric Trump must testify in a New York investigation into the family's businesses before the November presidential election. Rejecting lawyers' claims that Trump's extreme travel schedule on the campaign trail warranted a delay. State Judge Arthur Ngoran said that President Trump's son must comply with a subpoena for his testimony no later than October 7th, adding that the investigation and the court are not bound by the timeliness of the national election. 
Attorney General Letitia James, a Democrat, went to court to enforce the subpoena after Eric Trump's lawyers abruptly canceled a July interview with investigators in a probe about whether the family's company, the Trump Organization, lied about the value of its assets in order to get loans or tax benefits. Eric Trump, the company's executive vice president of development and acquisitions, was first served with the subpoena back in May. In the court filing last week, his lawyers said he was willing to comply with the subpoena, but only after the November 3rd elections. Matthew Coangelo, a lawyer for the attorney general's office, countered that Eric Trump's lawyers didn't have a legal basis to seek a delay and were doing so simply on the grounds of personal inconvenience to the witness. He argued that the typical compliance deadline courts have found is reasonable is five days. A huge international study of a COVID-19 vaccine that aims to work with just one dose is getting underway as top U.S. health officials seek to assure a skeptical Congress and public that they can trust any shots the government ultimately approves. Hopes are high that answers about at least one of several candidates being tested in the U.S. could come by year's end, maybe sooner. President Trump is pushing for a faster timeline to boost his re-election drive, which many experts say is risky and may not allow for adequate testing. Today, Trump tweeted a link to news about the new Johnson & Johnson vaccine study and said the Food and Drug Administration must move quickly said Senator Patty Murray, a Democrat from Washington State. President Trump is still trying to sabotage the work of our scientists and public health experts for his own political ends. She went on to tick off examples of White House pressure on the Food and Drug Administration. FDA Commissioner Stephen Hahn has pledged that career scientists and not politicians will decide whether any coronavirus vaccine meets clearly stated standards that it works and is safe. Vaccine development usually takes years, but scientists have been racing to shorten that time, in part by manufacturing doses that will have to be thrown away if studies show that they don't work. A handful of vaccines already are in final testing in the U.S. and other countries, and one of the largest studies yet, Johnson & Johnson, aims to enroll 60,000 volunteers to test its single-dose approach in the U.S., South Africa, Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Mexico, and Peru. Other vaccine candidates in the U.S. require two shots. J&J's vaccine is made with slightly different technology than others, modeled on an Ebola vaccine that the company created. More from reporter William Denislow. Unlike some of the rival COVID-19 vaccines being studied, the Johnson & Johnson version may just need one shot instead of two and doesn't need to be frozen. It's also set to be the largest phase three trial with 60,000 participants set to take part. The vaccine aims to produce coronavirus proteins rather than the actual virus, which can prepare the body's immune system to then fight off COVID-19. Johnson & Johnson's chief scientific officer says it hopes to know if the vaccine is effective and safe to use by the end of the year. William Danslow, New York. Dr. Anthony Fauci, the government's top infectious disease expert, told a Senate panel today that public vigilance and an eventual vaccine could bring the coronavirus under control. We feel strongly that if we have a combination of adherence to the public health measures together with a vaccine that will be distributed to people in this country and worldwide, we may be able to turn around this terrible pandemic that which we have been experiencing. Dr. Anthony Fauci testifying before the U.S. Senate today. Wisconsin Governor Tony Evers has declared a new public health emergency in Wisconsin and issued a new masking order as cases of COVID-19 there grow at a near exponential rate. Both orders go into effect immediately. They will expire after 60 days or with the declaration of a new order. Over the last seven days, the state has recorded a 16.5% positive rate in coronavirus testing. 
The order requires people to wear masks or face coverings in enclosed spaces where people congregate. There are exceptions for those who have medical issues and cannot wear a mask. Governor Evers says the recent surge in cases is among younger people. The Wisconsin Department of Health Services attributes the spread to in-person social gatherings. In the midst of the coronavirus pandemic and the resulting economic crisis, lawmakers in the House of Representatives say President Trump is flagrantly endorsing a Republican lawsuit to strike down the Affordable Care Act. If Republicans prevail in overturning the ACA, Experts say tens of millions of Americans could soon lose their health insurance. KPFA's Chris Lee reports. The Trump administration is endorsing a lawsuit filed by 18 Republican state attorneys general to strike down the Affordable Care Act, ACA, also known as Obamacare. That's the law that expands health insurance to millions of people who otherwise wouldn't have it. Democratic Representative Anna Eshoo from California and chair of the House Subcommittee on Health explains what is at stake if this lawsuit prevails. On November 10th, the Trump administration, along with Republican attorneys general, will argue before the Supreme Court that it should strike down the entirety of the Affordable Care Act. If successful, and they may be, 21 million Americans will lose health care immediately. Protections for the 133 million Americans with pre-existing conditions such as asthma, diabetes, and the lasting health conditions caused by COVID, uh, which has infected 7 million Americans to date, will be gone. Eshu says at a time when so many Americans are struggling to make ends meet, lawmakers should be making it easier for people to keep their health insurance not harder. She adds this is the first economic recession in which millions of Americans who lost their job-based health insurance have an affordable alternative because of the ACA. Approximately 20 million people who filed for unemployment benefits during the coronavirus pandemic are eligible for coverage through the ACA or Medicare, according to the Kaiser Family Foundation. While not all those people have signed up for ACA health insurance yet, Medicaid enrollment is climbing, according to Aviva Aaron Dean, Vice President for Health Policy at the Center for Budget and Policy Priorities. Medicaid enrollment is up 8% generally and up more in Medicaid expansion, which targets some of the most vulnerable people. But I think it's equally important that millions more people, 12 million more people are covered through Medicaid going into the pandemic than would have been without expansion. And there is at this point just um, a lot of research showing that it's improving their health, improving their financial security, reducing evictions um, and actually saving lives. And in fact, has been especially important to people with pre-existing conditions for whom it's enabled them to get regular treatment for chronic conditions for the first time. Aaron Dean says enrollment has especially risen in states like California that early on in the pandemic extended the enrollment period for Medicaid and the ACA. She explains that earlier analysis published by the Urban Institute last year indicates that some 20 million Americans would lose their health insurance if the Supreme Court strikes down the ACA as unconstitutional. However, the real figure is likely larger because their estimate doesn't include the tens of millions of Americans who recently lost their job and thus their health insurance due to the pandemic. According to the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, if the ACA were overturned, the highest income taxpayers would reap an estimated $45 billion in tax cuts every year. I'm Chris Lee, reporting for KPFA. The Navajo Nation is returning to a 57-hour lockdown weekend and stay-at-home orders due to a rise in COVID-19 cases on and near the Navajo Reservation. Antonio Gonzalez reports. Tuesday's announcement comes a day after top U.S. infectious disease expert Dr. Anthony Fauci praised the tribe for lowering numbers, crediting the tribe's strict COVID-19 measures, which were enforced for months. Some of the orders, including the 57-hour curfew, were eased. But during a virtual town hall Tuesday, Navajo Nation President Jonathan Nez had a stern message for residents to stay vigilant. Nez says a cluster of 40 or more positive cases trace back to travel and spreading the virus during social gatherings, which are currently restricted on Navajo land. And so we're going to have to 
slow everything down. We're going to have to put stay at home orders because we don't know how far this has gone out in contact with other people. The new cases were reported in Arizona and New Mexico. The tribe's also asking residents to avoid areas in Utah considered hot spots for the virus. I'm Antonia Gonzalez. And you are listening to the Evening News on KPFA Berkeley, KPFK Los Angeles, KFC at Fresno, online at kpfa.org. It's an hour-long newscast. There's a half-hour edition on the weekends, and you can listen to any of those newscasts whenever you like. They're archived online at kpfa.org. I'm Mark Miracle, and lots more news to come. In fact, too much news, and we've already brought you too much news because it is 35 minutes into the program, and I have yet to discharge my duty to try to raise the money that it takes to be able to put this newscast on the air at 6 o'clock every night. And in fact, the money that is needed to keep this radio station on the air so that the news can air each night at 6 o'clock. This is day number two of the fall fun drive here at KPFA. We have a goal of raising $450,000. Last night, I had a goal of raising money from 20 of you willing to make a financial pledge or an outright donation to this listener-sponsored station. I fell a little short. Let's call that beginner's bad luck. Let's say that since it was the first day of the drive here, You weren't familiar with um, the financial obligations attendant upon being a listener to this radio station, if I might be so presumptuous. A little different kind of concept. Fully listener-supported, not partially listener-supported, with a big hunk of cash coming from the corporations in the side door and rich people's money coming from through through the back door and foundation money flowing from the upper levels. 90% of KPFA's funds come from you, the listener, and that's the way it's been since we first started this radio station. With no money in the bank, just putting the station on the air and asking if people were willing to pay for the programming that were they were going to get on 94.1 FM, KPFA. It sort of worked. We had to go off the air for a little bit until we figured out a better approach to this fundraising thing over the air. But eventually it worked. You are this radio station's financial backbone. There is no one else. And so we have to open the mic. We have to beg. That's one. <laughs> that's, uh, that's really what it is when you boil it down. I'm, I'm begging you. 1 800 439 5732. If I have plucked a little string of your heart, or you can do it online at kpfa.org. to make a donation tonight. Since I didn't make it last night, tonight I have a goal of increasing by five. So twenty. I need to hear from 25 of you who are making a pledge or a donation. It is a pledge. You don't have to have the money in your pocket. You don't have to bring it down to the station right now. You can put it on your credit card. You can have it in your bank account. You can tie a monthly donation to your credit card or your bank account, $5 a month or $10 a month or $15 a month, or you can roll your own, you know, say like, uh, oh, I don't know, $6.83, 1-800-439-5732 or online at kpfa.org, 1-800-439-5732, looking to hear from 25 of you tonight. Whatever you can fork over, or you can spoon feed it to us. 1 800 439 5732 or online at 
kpfa.org. I mentioned there's plenty of news, too much news. Let's get back to it. 1-800-439-5732-kpfa.org. House Democrats introduced a bill today aimed at preventing future presidents from undermining democracy, ignoring the Constitution, and violating the law. It's the product of four years of Democratic frustration with the Trump administration. Supporters are calling it landmark legislation on a par with reform measures passed after the Watergate scandal of the 1970s. Christopher Martinez has a story. House Democratic leaders are preparing for democracy after Trump with legislation they call the Protecting Our Democracy Act. California Democrat Nancy Pelosi is the House Speaker. She says this is a -a once-in-a-generation moment to defend the rule of law and restore basic ethics to government. Our founders, in their wisdom, put guardrails into the Constitution of the United States because they knew that someone might overplay his or her hand. Uh, They probably could not envision a president who would kick over the guardrails And that the Senate of the United States would be complicit in that undermining of the Constitution of the United States. The Democrats say the four years of the Trump administration have been marked by a wide range of actions that violate the law, the Constitution, and American norms and values. Pelosi says the legislation is designed to address what she calls the president's staggering litany of abuses. Our chairs have crafted a robust reforms package uh, that can stand up and prevent an assault on our democracy, including the abuse of the pardon power that distinguished Mr. Schiff had talked about, the soliciting of foreign interference in U.S. elections, the retaliatory attacks on whistleblowers, politicization of the rules, uh, uh, the tools of justice, abuse of office for personal for personal enrichment and contempt of Congress's oversight powers on behalf of the American people, including our lawful subpoena power. Pelosi was joined by an array of Democratic House committee chairs to announce the new bill. Adam Schiff of California is chair of the House Intelligence Committee. He's also the man who led the House impeachment inquiry. He says Trump has viewed constraints on his power as an inconvenience and has exploited weaknesses to it with grave consequences for our nation. This bill is essential, not just because Donald Trump's presidency has been so damaging, though it has been, but because we owe it to the American people to put in place meaningful constraints on power, fix what is broken, and ensure that there is never again another Richard Nixon or Donald Trump for either party. What has become painfully clear is that even in a dangerous world, the threat to our democracy from outside the country is less than the threat from within. The guardrails that have been built over the course of the country's history and strengthened after Watergate have been shaken and broken. The bill covers a wide range of issues. It would remove the statute of limitations on federal crimes committed by a president or vice president. It would also boost congressional subpoena powers and codify the constitutional emoluments clause. It would expand prohibitions against foreign campaign contributions. Another provision would increase protections for whistleblowers and inspectors general. Democrat Carolyn Maloney is chair of the House Oversight and Reform Committee. We are witnessing a president who retaliates against whistleblowers and inspectors general, obstructs investigations to root out waste, fraud, and abuse, and openly mocks the law. It must stop. We have an obligation to take immediate action to rein in this uh, terrible behavior. The Protecting Our Democracies Act is a long wish list that incorporates several past democratic bills that have failed to move forward. Senator Schiff says he would like to see action on the bill this year, but he acknowledges the measure is unlikely to move forward in the current Republican-controlled Senate. So we're not terribly optimistic, but I will say this. I think these reforms will have bipartisan support next year uh, in a new administration uh, when my GOP colleagues uh, will not want to see a Democratic president do half the things uh, of uh, the current president. So while I don't expect to see GOP support in the Senate, this year, uh, I do expect these will these reforms will enjoy bipartisan support in the future. Reporting for Pacifica Radio News KPFA, I'm Christopher Martinez. California Governor Gavin Newsom announced today the state will stop sales of new gasoline-powered passenger cars and trucks by 2035, and he ordered state regulators to develop requirements to meet the goal. 
California would be the first state with such a rule, although Germany and France are among 15 other countries that have similar mandates. California already has rules mandating a certain percentage of new car sales be electric or zero emission vehicles. Newsom says the new requirement makes California a leader again on the issue of climate change. We have people that are in denial about science, denial about facts. In California, we want to lead with science. We want to address the issue of the facts that are easily observed, the evidence that is abundant as it relates to the hots getting hotter, the dries getting drier, the atmospheric rivers where the wets are getting wetter. We recognize something big has happened globally as it relates to climate change, and we want to take responsibility for leading. Newsom's plan would not ban people from owning gas powered cars or selling them on the used car market, but it would ban the sales of all new gasoline powered passenger cars and trucks in the state. Newsom says he's not taking away people's internal combustion engine vehicles, but California is shifting away from them. Several companies are already in line with that transition. Walmart came out and said, You are going to best California, and we are going to produce only. Zero emission truck fleet by 2040. That's the spirit of innovation. That's the spirit of partnership. This is not just about government. This is about the private sector and the entrepreneurial mindset of some of the biggest companies in the world that get it and want to get it done as well. Tesla yesterday, just coincidentally, advancing new innovation in batteries, bringing down the cost of batteries, extending not only the life of the batteries, but the range of the batteries. You're seeing innovation, you're seeing price parity within the next few years of electric vehicles. Newsom said the move will cut greenhouse gas emissions by 35% in the nation's most populous state. California and the roughly dozen states that follow its lead on auto emission standards make up a significant part of the U.S. auto market. Giving today's move huge potential impact for the U.S. automobile industry, as well as for long term efforts against pollution and climate change. Early this week, the Center for Biological Diversity notified Governor Newsom that it plans to sue to halt the state from handing out more permits for oil and gas wells. The group contends the state's permitting process is illegal and causes unacceptable climate. And health harms. California has issued more than 1,500 permits for new oil and gas wells so far this year. You're listening to the evening news on KPFA Berkeley, KPFK Los Angeles, KFCF Fresno, online at kpfa.org. <laughs> Hey everyone, this is Brian Edwards t e e k e r And I'm Kat Brooks. Weekday mornings, we host Upfront. Two hours of conversation about what's in the news and what should be politics, technology, prisons, police, what's happening in City Hall and at the State House, in Washington and in the streets. That's starting at 7 a.m. right after Democracy Now! on Upfront. Still looking for. The phone call or the online message from 25 of you who are listening to the evening news tonight that you are making a donation or a contribution or signing up to be a subscriber, signing up to be a listener sponsor of this alternative radio station, KPFA, here on day two of the Fund Drive. With the goal of raising $450,000 by the time we are done. Didn't make my goal of 20 donations last night, so I was forced to increase it tonight to 25. And we're on our way, but we need your help if we're going to get there by the end of the newscast, which is now just 10 minutes away. 1-800-439-5732 or kpfa.org, whatever you can do. $5 a month, $10 a month, $20 a month, straight out $60 contribution. Average donation is about $100, but we're not counting money tonight. We're counting people. We're counting on you to be the type of person that supports listener sponsored stations, that supports 
different views and political opinions and different voices being on the air. He was not satisfied with the kind of music that's available on other radio stations. If that's you, we're counting on you to be one of the 25 tonight to give us a call at 1-800-439-5732 or online at kpfa.org. The group Environment America is calling on California Governor Newsom to accelerate enforcement of SB 100 in the face of the record pace of wildfires striking California. 2018, California lawmakers passed Senate Bill 100, setting the state on a path to get 100% of its electricity from renewable and zero-carbon sources by the year 2045 and tasking state regulators, including the California Energy Commission, the California Public Utilities Commission, and the California Air Resources Board, with compiling a report due next January on how to implement the policy. KPFA's Daniel Witte reports. Environment America members say the best measure for climate action is renewable energy. The organization operates in 29 so states we'll s- and the U.S. We'll Capitol s- skip- and has pioneered clean and uh, renewable energy since the Noah, 1970s. We'll Johanna we'll Newman, the Julia senior director Chapman for Environment Murray. America, says the recent spate of wildfires and hurricanes underscores the need for climate action, including a shift to renewable energy. Now, I'm sitting here in my home in Amherst, Massachusetts, where we um, have been struggling all summer with a massive drought. The rivers that my family loves to paddle on here in western Massachusetts have basically been reduced to a trickle this summer. And there are many routes that we've often traveled that are literally closed to us because there's not enough water in the rivers. Meanwhile, my brother lives in San Francisco, and he, like many people in that part of the country, has you know, posted apocalyptic-looking orange sky pictures on Facebook and has told me about how he and his girlfriend you know, have to sleep next to the air filter in their apartment so that they have air that they can breathe. Pointing to a graph of data from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, Newman says the potential for clean energy creation far outweighs the amount of electricity currently consumed in the U.S. That means the United States could power its economy using clean sources. Dan Jacobson, the state director for Environment California, says they've been working behind the scenes for years to expand renewable energy generation in the state. One successful effort is the Million Roofs Project, a 10-year rebate program to promote solar rooftop installation. He says as a result, just last year in 2019, the California Energy Commission passed a law requiring that all homes be built with solar panels on them starting in 2020. There's also the Renewable Portfolio Standard, which requires utility companies and energy providers to purchase a certain percentage of power from clean energy sources. Then last year, SB 100 went into effect, requiring California to use 100% renewable energy by the year 2045. Jacobson gives some historic statistics on the downward trend of greenhouse gas use in California. In 2000, California was generating about 100 million metric tons of GHGs um, from electricity, greenhouse gas pollution from electricity. And you can see that as the renewable portfolio standard was passed and implemented, along with some of the other measures like the million solar roofs, um, we have seen the pollution go down. And it's gone down from about 100, 120 at its peak, to now 60. Jacobson says the transportation sector must shift too. Transportation accounts for over 40% of the global warming pollution that California generates. 
passenger vehicles make up 28% of this pollution. Jacobson says public transportation industries can help by using more electric buses and cars rather than gasoline. People, on the other hand, can help by doubling their use of public transportation, walking, or bicycling within their communities. For KPFA News, I'm Daniel Witte. Just three minutes left in the newscast, and we need five more of you to go to the phone at 1-800-439-5732 or go to your keyboard at kpfa.org and become one of the 25 supporters, financial supporters of this newscast here tonight, 1-800-439-5732, five more to go, or at kpfa.org. Belarusian President Alexander Lukashenko was inaugurated today for another term in the capital of Minsk. The swearing-in ceremony was not announced in advance. Mass protests against the authoritarian ruler's re-election have been ongoing since the August 9th election. Julia Chapman reports from Moscow. Belarusian state media has reported that a swearing-in ceremony was held in Minsk, confirming Alexander Lukashenko as president once again. It comes after the Central Election Commission declared him the winner of an August election with more than 80% of the vote. Opposition figures have contested the result and have led daily protests ever since. Hundreds of people reportedly attended the inauguration, which was not announced in advance, in a likely effort to avoid further demonstrations. Lukashenko has led Belarus for 26 years. Julia Chapman, Moscow. Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny was released today from a German hospital that had been treating him from po- for poisoning. Trent Murray reports from Berlin. Well, we received this statement from the Charité Hospital at around 9am local time here in Berlin. Uh, they said that Alexei Navalny had been released overnight from his acute uh, inpatient care. He was, of course, flown to Germany for emergency treatment just over a month ago after collapsing on a domestic flight within Russia. Uh, subsequent tests show that he had traces of Novichok in his system, which is a Soviet-era nerve agent linked to several other high-profile cases, including the chemical attack on the Scripples in the British village of Salisbury. Now, his doctors say that it is still too early to gauge the long-term health impacts of the poisoning, but that Mr Navani uh, has been released to continue his recovery outside hospital alongside his wife. Trent Murray, Berlin. Firefighters have tamed more of an enormous wildfire burning in the mountains northeast of Los Angeles. Containment was up today, and officials are confident the crews will make further progress in the next few days before hot, dry winds return to Southern California over the weekend. The Bobcat Fire, one of the largest on record in Los Angeles County, is 38% contained. That's a big jump from just 17% a day earlier. Meanwhile, a major fire in the northern part of the state, the CZU Lightning Complex, is now 100% contained. 60 seconds to go. We still need a couple more phone calls here at 1-800-439-5732. That would be phone calls from listeners with money who are willing to give some of it to keep this radio station on the air. 1-800-439-5732. We're looking for the same kind of person online at kpfa.org. Do what you can do to keep this listener-sponsored station on the air and functioning during the coming months. Morning fog tomorrow in the San Francisco Bay Area, then clearing by the afternoon with Highs in the low 70s around the bay. Partly cloudy all day inland tomorrow with highs in the mid 80s. Sunny and a high near 90 degrees in the Central Valley. Sunny and highs in the mid 80s in Los Angeles. Tune in Wednesday nights starting at 7 p.m. with Bay Native Circle. Bringing you today's native issues, people, culture, and events with weekly rotating hosts. Then at 8 p.m., it's Dead to the World with Tim Lynch, featuring the music of the Grateful Dead, the music it's influenced and influenced by. And the night at 10 p.m. with Sing Out, a showcase of the world's ever-changing music realm, hosted by Larry Kelp. 
That's Wednesday nights on 94.1 KPFA and kpfa.org. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz, and online worldwide at kpfa.org. The following program 